policy right. Um, and for opening our event, I'm very, very happy to call uh, Mate Kipin, from, uh, who is the head of Division for Climate Policy at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And yeah, I would love to hear you, your words. <laughs> No, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Priscilla. Um, uh, actually, I'm supposed to welcome you in your pavilion, but um, I would rather say thanks for welcoming me in your uh, pavilion. Uh, I'm, I'm told you're having an impressive uh, program of side events uh, here. No doubt about that. I feel you were saying busy, busy days of COP. Well, we are not yet the last day, right? Uh, tomorrow, in the best case, would be. I guess realistically, it might be Saturday or Sunday. I fear many of colleagues um, uh, who are in these busy negotiations, they have much too little time to really appreciate that interesting program you are offering here. Although I believe uh, building sustainable building um, and the, uh, well, the role of the whole building and also urbanization area in the climate space is so underrated for the time being that it would deserve much, much more attention. I think very few colleagues are aware actually of the, well, first of all, the uh, important carbon footprint um, uh, construction buildings currently have um, and will increasingly have over time, looking at the uh, urbanization rates, uh, we, are, we are seeing uh, the uh, prospects for further construction, but also um, of the potential um, to actually do better um, uh, on the climate front uh, in building and construction. Just to share an anecdote, um, my ministry headquarters in Berlin um, is, uh, is planning a new building because um, uh, uh, it's getting too, too small where we are hosted now. Uh, so it's supposed to be the first uh, full wooden uh, uh, high-rise structure in Berlin. So looking very much forward to that. Unfortunately, that'll take still another 10 years or so. Um, uh, but at least a uh, slight indication also on our very specific institutional end at BMZ, so the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation, that we are trying to do our part here. Um, uh, but maybe a couple, a couple of, uh, of elements um, so um, to frame the discussion. The bigger picture, so rapid urbanization in emerging and developing countries in Germany is not among these. <laughs> so our demography is rather, rather slower declining. But in emerging and developing countries is one of the greatest transformative forces of our time, right? With huge opportunities, but also huge challenges, not least for, for climate, right? So the global floor area for buildings will double until uh, 2060. On the African continent, um, we are not here on the African continent, but still in an African country, um, uh, we even expect a triplication. So just imagine what that could mean for our climate when these buildings are built of trillions of tons of concrete and steel. So um, importantly, this urbanization process is increasingly decoupled from economic growth. So that gives us hope, as economic growth in general is increasingly being decoupled from, uh, um, from emissions also. Uh, almost um, a quarter of the global urban population, around 900 million, live in informal settlements as we speak. Until 2030, we might have as many as 3 billion people without access to adequate housing worldwide. Um, I therefore propose that we don't just need a green transition of the construction sector, but also a just transition. And that's, as you can imagine, in particular also the perspective from a development cooperation ministry from which I am. Um, so we need a global turnaround that makes the buildings and construction sector first more, well, it makes it climate neutral, more socially access, uh, accessible and connected to the creation of green jobs, because that's also a huge potential in const uh, sustainable construction to actually create not only green, but also good jobs. So a key question is how much money do we need for the transition of the building sector? The International Finance Corporation reckons that we need to invest as much as 24.7 trillion, trillion US until 2030. Major part of these investments needs to be allocated to cities, which play a key role in providing a low carbon building stock. As BMZ, so our development corporation ministry, we are committed to providing cities with better access to climate finance. Last year, we decided to allocate uh, additional funds to a new zero carbon building stream within the city's climate finance leadership alliance. I think we have their logo while well, we had it there on the screen. Um, 
to more uh, consciously uh, position sustainable buildings and construction as a key sector in this debate. One of the results is a city guide that we are here to launch today. I'm learning, so looking forward to that. Um, the city guide covers financial and policy instruments along the building value chain to facilitate investments in low carbon buildings. So I hope you're as excited as myself, and I really are, to hear about um, the initial findings of the guide and the panel discussion. So I wish you, well, all of us, an inspiring event and looking very much forward to the discussion. And thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Thank you so much, and I think uh, thank you also for Miazet from the support. And I think as as the city's climate finance leadership alliance, we are working, and um, Chavi will tell you a little bit about our work too. But we are working to try to increase the amount of finance that actually climate specific finance that cities are receiving. And I think one of the big conclusions, yes, definitely if you're talking about urban climate finance, we should be talking about buildings. So a lot of the emissions are coming from. And when we start digging into the building sector and trying to understand more of policies and financial instruments, that's where the challenges, specific challenges start. So um, I think we're very glad to be able to go to the nitty gritty details and like trying to find some solutions on that front. And then, um, we're actually pre-launching this guide that we hope it will be useful for the CCFLA membership, but also for our, the cities themselves. And then I will have very happy to have here my colleague from CPI, uh, Chavi uh, Mittal, who is a senior analyst at Climate Policy Initiative. She will show you some of our initial results and like uh, kickstart our debate for this this next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, can we have the slides? So I'm sure this audience is very well aware about the importance of the building sector to achieve our climate goals and probably, uh, you know, you already see these numbers out there, but let me hammer them a little more to you. So yes, uh, I mean, 37% uh, of energy-related uh, carbon emissions are coming from the building sector, 10% of, 10 of which is actually coming from material and construction investments. But what does it mean financing terms? We're looking at this as an opportunity around 5.2 to 5.4 trillion dollars, out of which uh, 5 trillion is estimated to be coming from, you know, transferring your existing annual investments that you see here to kind of low carbon alternatives. And then we also have these financing gap of 300 to 500 billion. So it translates to this whole big opportunity that we're seeing here. And then definitely city are really the heart and the center of this transition because of the reason that was mentioned earlier about growing urban population and increasing demand for it. Most of our building stocks are actually existing in the cities. And also the very fact that, you know, they will, these uh, building in cities would be, you know, in instrumental in uh, helping cities sort of achieve their environmental, social, and economic objectives. So why the financing is really not flowing? And the slides, uh, I hope I'm going to discuss, decode this for you but shows you why, what are the financing barriers. So what CPI did under a study, which is going to get published in, I think, January next year, was try to do a sort of a meta assessment of these different studies out there and try to see what are the key barriers. And they're sort of categorized in these four uh, key type of uh, barriers. So one is financial barriers. You have the investment risk. You're talking about the mandates, uh, uh, market readiness barriers, and also the regulatory barriers. So on an average, um, you know, Definitely, financing barrier uh, followed by investment risk emerges as a key barrier, but, but it, the story is much more nuanced out here. So what we try to do is look at the four thematic areas under the building sector, and those were out there in the last four columns there that you see about cooling, on embodied carbon, on adaptation, and I don't think so if you can see just transition out there. So yeah, those adaptation is the one that you can't probably see on your screen right now. So it's much more nuanced here. So for, for instance, for embodied carbon, it's actually a uh, market readiness that becomes a much more important barrier and the investment key risk barrier. And this is mainly because the sector sort of, this thematic particular thematic area sort of kind of, uh, you know, does not have a very obvious mitigation potential that's visible because of the indirect carbon that's embedded in it. So the results are sort of in a clear, leads to a sort of a lack of awareness of performance data, you know, and existing solutions to this sector. So that's why you see sort of these different barriers having a different um, effectiveness on you know, what solutions within the building we, we talk about. 
And of course, these barriers are not like isolated problems. They're very, very strongly. That's adaptation, the adaptation. So yeah, the, and these barriers are sort of strongly interconnected, right? They have influence, like how we're addressing one barrier has an influence how the other ones get addressed and how the impact of the other barrier is gonna be. So for instance, uh, you know, you see uh, definitely from financing or demand side perspective, it is actually the financing barrier that, that's critical. But you know, uh, how are we addressing market readiness or building in regulations in have an impact. So it's, uh, it's a very, very nuanced story out there. Okay, I don't know why I can't turn on the next slide. Yeah. I, I think the sticker is now working. Okay, yeah, it's here. So, you know, now how do we sort of address these barriers? You know, the good news is there are more than 70 financial and policy instruments that are out there to kind of help achieve that transition. And these could be very specialized, you know, instruments. Uh, so for instance, you know, or mandatory, policy instruments where we're talking about construction waste or uh, 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 landfill diversions, or it could be like, you know, pay as you save, uh, that kind of addresses some specific affordability barriers. But it could be also very general as one, right? Like expediting the permissions, or it could be like, you know, cost of subsidies or debt instruments. So what the study looked at was uh, almost uh, 40, 44 uh, financial instruments and over 30, 35 uh, uh, policy instruments. And that those that have been, you know, widely sort of implemented or being piloted or in the process of being piloted. And each of these policy instruments, again, goes without saying, has a very different impact on the barriers we, we saw earlier in the earlier slide. Um, so kind of the more important point here is that, you know, these are sort of, again, sort of integrated. The policies and the financing instruments, uh, they cannot be seen in isolation. They need to be seen together. And what cities can do is not implement like 70 or the odd instrument policy together, but we need to really find the most impactful pathway around it. And now, I mean, as you would have probably guessed it, uh, the path is not very, very, very linear, and this could be a little more complex. And our study will look into deep dive into, into this and a lot more other things. So this is a very simplified version, <laughs> if I can say so. Um, so yeah, let me break it down to you, De break it down this for you. So firstly, the capacity and the fiscal instruments, they are sort of the systemic enablers, we all know about that, how to kind of optimize the zero transition. But they have a very much influence on the mandates. And when I say mandates, they are like, you know, building owners providing in data, or, you know, setting up a standards in the building, et cetera, which is really at the center of the sector. And while they rely on capacity development and fiscal, they really influence a lot of these other financing instruments that you're looking at here, whether you're talking about business models, we're talking about structure financing strategies, or asset models, and a lot of other debt instruments out there. And uh, again, I just want to give you a bit of example here, so it's, it doesn't look that confusing to you. Uh, so two main um, you know, instruments or policy cards that we found with more Im impact kind of implementing the cooling solutions were actually pay as you save and you know, sort of having these uh, Pay as you save and also pace. I think it's probably not in the slide or something, but yeah. Uh, so when I say pace, is the property assessment for energy, uh, clean energy, and pace is pay as you save. And they were found to be the one of the most impactful uh, pathways for cities to kind of achieve more cooling solutions. And while the former, which is the pace, kind of helps, uh, you know, getting cities kind of cover the upfront cost themselves directly by by the increased valuation of the property and adjusting the property tax. Uh, PACE is kind of helping consumers to repay the equipment, right? Uh, in the longer cost when you're kind of achieving savings by which is much over, above, over and above the business's usual ones. But for what, for, for those instruments to be effective, what is really important is all these other, other uh, key elements that we see here, which is like benchmarking labor for equipment or you know, advanced metering infrastructure. So for effective in financial instrument implementation, you need a couple of, uh, a couple of these policy uh, mandates or uh, instruments in place to kind of achieve those. And they can be done in synchronization with a lot of other uh, instruments as well. And uh, to implement these instruments, we definitely need, uh, we need sort of this uh, coordination and cooperation and solidarity among different capital providers. And of course, the role of cities is sort of critical out there, right? In helping, you know, 
building and kind of pushing forward for capacity development for design and construction industry. So imagine, uh, you know, you have a procurement of net zero carbon technologies for in, in public buildings, how that not only reduces the direct emissions, but also kind of set pace or set pilot for private sector to intervene. So it's more about like believing what you see, right? And then, of course, the role of DFIs and, you know, how they're going to be de-risking or blend finance instruments and, you know, all the other policies, instruments or financing of different capital providers, whether public or private, will come in from there. And I know a lot of uh, you kind of working in these different spaces and capacity development on DFI financing and a lot of uh, other aspects that we talked about. So very, very happy to hear about you, how we can really, you know, get the financing that we need for this building transition, you know, zero carbon building transition. So thank you. With that, I pass to Pri and looking forward to a very rich discussion. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chavi. So our goal, um, hopefully you can hear me. So our goal is to actually, we are peer reviewing, uh, but to publish something useful for cities, actually publish a guide. We need to discuss policies at the city level, but policies at the city level won't be all we need, right? Like we need to involve national governments and different players. Um, and I want to kickstart a discussion and hear from practitioners that are on the ground. Uh, so I would love to invite Sumia Shaturvedula, who is Deputy Director from ECLE South Asia. So if you can come, please join us. I'll sit here. Uh, then we have Mike uh, Eckenstadt, Head of sec uh, Sector for Energy, Water and Infrastructure at GIZ, at least the PIB initiative, so if you can. And we will have, unfortunately online, Prashad, because you were here last week, Prashad Kapoor, who is the Chief of Industry, uh, especially Green Buildings and Green Cities at IFC. Um, so. Actually, we, hear, we heard this week that um, we have 80 billion people in the world right now, right? Like, in, which is a very uh, scary number as it's going so fast. Uh, and a lot of these people will live in cities. And then we know that, I will start with you, Sumaya, that we know that ECLE is actually engaged at the global level, shaping policy and action. What are the barriers, of, particularly on the policy space, which is what we want to address here, either national or locally, that you can see cities facing while trying to finance net zero carbon buildings? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so when we look at the policy uh, scape, uh, while the action is happening at uh, the city level, the policy directives are coming from the national from uh, the provincial or the state and uh, implementation at the city level with some scope for tweaking policies at the local level. It's not uh, that cities have uh, you know, free reign to influence policy as much as they would like, and that would be our ideal situation, but uh, today that is not what we are seeing. I could speak at least uh, for cities from uh, the Asia region. And uh, in terms of national policies, so pretty much uh, across the scape, there is some form of national policy that is driving green buildings. Whether it is driving green buildings to the extent that uh, you know we would like to see it to transition to net zero is a question. Right now, I think where the policy scape is, is that uh, it looks at green buildings, it looks at retrofits, it looks at building envelope, something on uh, construction material, but the deep dive retrofitting that you want to see or uh, the kind of LC analysis that is required for buildings, uh, this is not mandated by policy. So I think a case in point um, would be, I could speak from the Indian context, is where you have, and then the plethora of policies that exist, right? So you have the uh, national building code and then you have uh, these uh, um, kind of rating systems that are mandated or let me say are supported by the national government so you would have the IGBC you would have the Griha which is uh, Indian specific you would have the lead and then you have the national building code uh, which doesn't go as far as these uh, rating mechanisms but then uh, all of these are directives that are coming and then you have the uh, energy uh, building code for uh, commercial entities you have an energy building code for the residents entities and now it's left to the cities um, to figure whether they want to buy in to one or more of these while they're mandated for the national building code they're not mandated to look at the others uh, some states have come up with uh, fiscal incentives uh, for 
for example, buildings that have a silver rating, a gold, or a platinum rating from IGBC. There are FAR incentives. There are fiscal incentives in terms of property tax reduction, et cetera. But again, uh, the onus for implementation is uh, at uh, the city level. So ultimately, it comes down to uh, the capacities that exist within these cities. It comes down to the interest of the cities to actually take on uh, some of these uh, you know, policies, to implement some of these policies, and then the entire implementation mechanism uh, you know, is uh, left to the cities. So that is where the cities are in this policy landscape today. So um, can you hear? Yeah, thank you so much for, for your remarks. And like you're, you already just said, and like I think from the message I got, it's like cities, they can tweak the policies, but they also need to be able to understand it and try to decide and like walk through all of that and I think this is particular I think was what Chavi also said like the complexity of the system and like how can we navigate over that and support cities and um, implementing uh, these policies of <laughs> if they need to be able to achieve finance and then uh, Mike I would love to hear from you because PB is doing a, a very very interesting work on regulatory barriers and uh, capacity constraints and could you tell us a little bit more on uh, the, the same the same logic let's go for the barriers before so we are more positive at the end of the session so like what have you been seeing out there from the project that you are supporting uh, the, how can local governments play the uh, to overcome the investment barriers on green cities and what do you think national governments what is their role yeah thank you very much for the question and uh, thanks for having us here I represent today the program called um, Program for Energy Efficiency in Buildings. Uh, we call it PEEP as an abbreviation. And it's a joint German-French initiative which we started a couple of uh, years ago in the context of another climate uh, conference in, in Marrakesh. And uh, I mean the, um, the building sector is often talked about as the big sleeping giant for climate protection and greenhouse gas reductions and really the um, the, the, the vision of, of the P program together with many other programs is really to, to wake up this sleeping giant and make it a big climate friendly giant and move, move this giant into the, the right direction. And this is how we started a couple of years ago um, and putting together uh, with support from the German and the French government a program um, which is jointly being implemented by um, the organization that I represent, which is GIZ, the German International Cooperation Agency, and on the French side, uh, two partners. One is the Agence Française du Développement, the French Development Bank, and also the ADEM, the uh, French Agency for the Ecological Transition. So jointly, we've put together this program to um, work with partner governments on, on the building sector and to um, offer support packages that integrate capacity building, policy advice, but also eventually financing that uh, AFD as a development bank can bring in a, in a big way. We uh, today uh, have developed a investment pipeline uh, of about uh, 3 billion euros uh, that will eventually be implemented by, by AFD. And uh, on, on the policy side, we really try to uh, take a multi-level government approach uh, to really see what is needed? I mean, the, 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 the governance settings are very, very different in from country to country. The authorities of cities to act on their own is, is very different from country to country. So there's no one size fits all, and you really have to understand the, the challenges for a particular country. And uh, we have really in-depth operations currently in five countries, three of them in, uh, no, four, four of them actually in Africa. And you see the African challenge very nicely put on this side of the, of the room. Um, and as so, so the approach is really to, to have a, a long-term engagement with governments on the regulatory side, on the uh, policy side, also a bit of capacity building for actors in the private sector with architects, with city planners. Uh, but as I said, eventually leading to, to investment primarily in public buildings. And, uh, and, and so, so really understanding who is responsible for what, who can do what, and then to provide partners with best practices, as we've heard from the presentation uh, uh, earlier today, um, to provide them with the best practices, with learning, with capacity building, and to really look at it in an integrated manner. What needs to be done at all two or three levels of governance to um, 
create that enabling framework and eventually also incentivize the private sector investment uh, that is that is I think uh, needed to really finance the transition. Public funding will not suffice to to um, to 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 engage and to really um, work in a tr transform transformative manner. So. Uh, that, that's really how we look at it in, a, in an integrated manner, and uh, I can say a few wo more words maybe in the course of the discussion about the program. Oh, I, have, I have it. <laughs> Completely forgot. No, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And I think like um, this actually integrated manner of seeing um, from the city side, it was also a bit what we heard uh, from Sumai, from Ikle, like uh, th the challenge of having this integration that goes to the city on the terms of policy regulation from the national government and th the need from this integration. I, Prasha, I would love to hear from you. I'm looking at the screen to see if I see you. Um, so the IFC has done an amazing job on like raising and, and telling us a, a bit more about how the opportunities in terms of finance, uh, particularly on the emerging market. Of course, I have a number because we have so many around us and I think it's important to deal with them so like on the on the four cities is around 20 24.7 trillion opportunities in emerging markets for building so like how can local governments especially in emerging markets increase the low carbon investment opportunities of green buildings and how do you see that from your perspective in IFC great uh, thanks Priscilla um, you know, we've been uh, working on financing, obviously, but also uh, coming back to some of the other speakers, we've also been helping some of the cities with the building building regulations, green building regulations, like Jakarta and cities in in uh, Philippines, uh, in Colombia and places, what, and, and even tried it in Bangladesh and places like that. So, um, but what, one key, my suggestion there is that, you know, three takeaways for local governments. Uh, I think definitely, uh, I think rather than looking at it as policy, hardcore policy, which is a, you know, it, which works really well in developed markets. I don't think you can just take that here directly, uh, you know, and I think maybe in some markets like China where regulations is the key way. Uh, are you able to hear me clearly? Sorry, I, I, you're okay? Yeah, okay. So where regulations uh, are a great instrument, you know, they are able to deliver it, but some of the, some of the places, this is not an easy challenge, it's, you know, sort of, you know, India has tried regulating this since 2007, right? It's barely got any projects under its belt in terms of the regulation. Then it's pretty, you know, uh, let's not. So I think, so I think the key thing is that, you know, and the, you know, and the, and the trouble is when you have invested so much on it, then it's very difficult to re retweak it. There's no energy left and then the momentum dies. So my suggestion is not look at it as purely regulatory. Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of, um, I think as Mike said uh, very well, incentives in a broader sense, you know, setting the rules of the game. I think that's the best way, that's one. Uh, yeah. Whether it's policy and incentives, and I can come to some of the ideas, I think um, uh, Chavi also mentioned earlier, so we can talk about that. The second is they need to walk the yeah. talk. Um, you know, I think if government is not able to do their own buildings right, then who are they to sell others to do it right? I think that's something that's important. It will send the right message. It will create some of the capacity that we were talking about earlier, capacity building. All of that would happen somewhat from that, right? And then lastly, I think um, finance is a key part. I think local governments actually they surprisingly can play a big role uh, in enabling financing, okay? Uh, by you know, and we can go into that in a, in a bigger way uh, later on. But but broadly, I think you know, I think again, I just wanted to emphasize. Uh, uh, I think the key one, it, it, that's my priority order, if you like, setting the rules of the game uh, could be quite interesting way. And we have seen places like Colombia, where you know we entered, we we started to work in that market, and just, just through about three or four years, actually, 20, 30 percent of all of Colombian new construction is meeting uh you know green building standard right the edge standard so and it was done through a simple green bond by a bank first uh, and then them working with a few developers it created the momentum and now we have five banks offering this you know and 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 great sort of and it didn't even start with any subsidy if you know what i mean it just started with the key momentum from some sector so i think i think the role of government is important because they enable some of this to happen i think that's something that they should uh, really look at and i you know i think I'll, I'll stop there but i think we can go into that a little later uh, as well no thank you and, and and i think you 
your final words, it's, it's exactly where we want to go. So I think if we're talking about solutions, we need examples. <coughs> so very interesting to hear on the Colombia one and how this momentum and the, the actually the policy um, helped by the investment and the bonds like help to structure um, like the building uh, strategy in the country. So let's talk about examples and solutions. And I think we still need to hear at least at, at the city level, um, we need case studies. We need to understand what other cities are doing so we, we can help on that front. And I think Ikele is particularly well positioned to give us these examples that are working so closely to the cities. And I want you to hear a bit about your experience, how you have helped cities to improve the energy efficiency in buildings, and um, if you can bring us some lessons learned. Sure, glad to do that. Um, I think I, I agree with uh, what was just said, that it's just not policy, but I think it's a mix of different factors that would kind of move this uh, green buildings, um, uh, mo that would give the momentum for green buildings uh, in cities. So uh, one thing that cities have realized and have recognized is that they need to be the early movers, that they need to be the leader in the room, otherwise they're not getting uh, the commercial residential sector to, to follow. And we have uh, good examples of this. Uh, I can talk about um, the state of Gujarat, the uh, state of Maharashtra, Nagpur, Ahmedabad, Rajkot in Gujarat. So all of these have uh, states and cities have taken the lead to try and build in some of the green building elements into social housing. So right now social housing is the biggest um, housing market in India and uh, through I think uh, funded through the Prime Minister's uh, uh, scheme called the Avas Yojana or uh, the scheme for uh, social housing. This is seen to be one of the greatest opportunities to move the needle forward on green buildings. And that is where I think in the tender and procurement practices for the social housing, the local authorities have built in some of these. They have not gone the full extent of you know, trying to um, get a green building certificate. Uh, some they have, uh, for example, again, uh, the IGBC standards in India are easier than the, um, you know, Griha standards that have come out, and they have been able to meet the silver rating of the IGBC standards. So doing this in social housing has, uh, you know, changed the entire narrative. They have shown that if you could do it in social housing, then doing it in uh, middle-income group housing, do it in uh, luxury condominiums that are being built in a, in a very large scale in India, that uh, it it is part of the market now. And uh, developers are being forced to put that as part of their portfolio. And uh, previously, I would say about five, six years ago, while it was considered a premium, now at least in the upper middle income group, in uh, the segment above that, uh, it is found to be standard de rigueur. So it is said to be uh, the base that uh, developers will have to meet. All of this is uh, not done overnight. There is tremendous capacity building that needs to happen in the private sector as well. It, the entire construction industry uh, needs, there, there needs to be capacity building. It has to start right from uh, the construction workers and up to the uh, building coalitions that exist, uh, the association of builders that exist. While we have certain prime movers who are the largest builders uh, in the region uh, taking it on, for it to percol percolate to uh, the smaller builders, the middle segment, I think that still takes uh, a bit of time. But uh, the leadership is there from the cities. We are seeing that in terms of fiscal policies, uh, they are being addressed and we see that. What we are not seeing yet that we would like to see is to have certain frameworks around uh, performance management. So energy performance management and reporting, this needs to be standardized. That is where you're going to create an evidence base. And that evidence base is missing. So today we're still speaking of case studies, and I don't think that is enough. Unless you see, um, you know, frameworks for uh, performance management, unless you see evidence on a large scale, that is where you will see the kind of shift that you were talking about. That you know, you move uh, the entire building sector and uh, the green building sector. Also, a lot of this discussion that's happening on materials that is not reflected in local markets. Um, the shift from uh, you know, regular cement, Portland cement to LC3 cement. And there is a big opportunity there, and we've uh, seen that. So these are things that need to pick up in the market. I think we need to get our frameworks right. We need to get performance management right and move from uh, 
in one way green washing to actually deep re retrofitting one is the building stock that you're actually building but then you have all this building stock that's al already built and so where do you build in deep re retrofitting i think that's another uh, challenge and hopefully we will move from the case studies to you know what is data go so thank you well thanks and i'll definitely need to move from the, the case studies to action and i think you you raised so many important uh, points um i'll Jump into two, like some, and then I have heard uh, around COP about that. Like uh, we we talk a lot about new buildings, I'm always giving these examples, but we need to talk about the buildings that are done, that we need to retrofit, that we need to change, and the buildings that we need to, um, that were even built in a green way, but it's like they're gonna have five years, ten years, and how are we gonna manage that, and what are the financial instruments available to respond to it? I think you mentioned one thing, and I will jump to Praj then now, just because. Uh, we had a question for him on that front, which is certification and the role of the private sector on this. So like that we need to also educate them to <laughs> increase. And I think IFC with the edge certification had a big role to play. And I wanted to ask you, what, what is this role of the edge and like how can it support particularly cities and improving the resilient investment on the front brush? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I think it can, you know, particularly in emerging markets, um, you know, where what we found actually that, you know, there wasn't a, a quick, simple, affordable rating system that can be accessed by cities, right? Um, more than that, um, something that really, I mean, you know, a lot of, lot of times it's sort of so broad that the climate and resource efficiency aspects gets, gets lost in the whole sort of many uh, aspects of a rating system. So essentially we had to find a way that, um, you know, from an investment perspective that, you know, when we invest in an asset, the asset has got good water, energy, materials efficiency, uh, it's quantifiable, there's some third party and, and, the, and the developer or the client is able to quickly use a tool to quickly figure out, you know, what difference would it make if I put solar panels or put insulation, you know, how much would it cost, uh, and then quickly make these decisions, right? So we found that for our own investments, we do about a billion dollars of green in building investments ourselves. And we found that actually, once the clients see it, um, right, and uh, that, that actually the savings is pretty decent and it's not as expensive as they imagine it to be, most people get it. So, and that's really what we spun off as Edge, uh, essentially. Now it's available in all, all markets and it's sort of grown. It, we've got like 50 million square meters certified now across the world. And, and but, but, but more than that, you know, what the certification allows you to do is think of it from an investor perspective, right? It allows you to have, you know, the assurance from a third party that this has been validated, right? Otherwise, you know, architects, uh, clients, developers particularly, you know, tend to kind of, you know, yeah, kind of have, uh, what's the right phrase, <laughs> without being too insensitive, they make up some of the ideas of what they aspire to and may not really have, you know, eco this and eco that. So how do we really know if this is green, right? The second is you need to have some sort of quantifiable method. You need to be able to count the carbon, count the kilowatt hours saved, and to be able to connect it with our donors and, and to be able to report, right? So that's an important aspect. And lastly, you need to be able to have a tool where the client is not just doing this for greater good, is able to use the tool to explain it to themselves if they're occupying the building or to their clients that this is actually going to save them money so that it becomes a marketing aspect as much as in, a, in, a, in the right sort of way rather than greenwashing. So that's kind of where we started off. And essentially that led us, you know, creating a pipeline and then uh, the tool like uh, Edge and a certification like Edge allows us to do green mortgages, right? So we've done many investments with banks, financial institutions, private banks across the world. Um, and we've said, okay, here, here is the money, $100 million, go and seek green projects, right? And that could be in the developers or, or more interestingly, once the pipeline is created to give home loads, the mortgages to make this work. I think we learned it from the the German example in Mexico, and we have really started to scale this up uh, across the world. Uh, so that's been a great story. I think we need concessional funds for that. And yeah, I wanted to touch on one aspect that is uh, uh, the kind of uh, not normally touched. We tend to focus so much on new construction, and, and it's right that we do, because especially in emerging markets, that is the low hanging fruit. But as you mentioned earlier, existing buildings is a much tougher nut to crack. Okay, and and you know when it comes to new construction, getting to about 20-40% reduction, 
you know, probably has a three, four year payback max, right? But when you look at refurbishment of a commercial buildings, we're talking, if you're trying to get anything like 20, 40%, uh, reduction, we're talking, you know, if you go beyond the air conditioning system replacement, facade replacements, glass replacements, shading devices, things like that, we're talking at 25 years payback. Uh, so we really have to relook at this space and say, how do we get patient capital? Is the cost of electricity really valued correctly, right? How do we make this work? Because 25 years, no investor is going to buy it right away and definitely not a a developer that has tended to the property. So I think uh, I have some ideas, but but want to just flag that it's not uh, it's not a done deal. And this is where the role of carbon pricing, regulations, having um, I think somebody mentioned earlier the pay as you save or, or you know third party financing. Those kind of ideas really make sense, right? We have to focus on that now. I think the time for you know hoping that a policy change will make a difference. I think. That is okay for a fast growing economy where it's going to double in stock in, you know, let's say India, but for most of the other countries where, you know, existing stock is going to be the thing that stays, that is, that is important. And lastly, if I can leave with this uh, from my side is, is the, is the, is the embodied energy. I think you touched on it. Edge allows you to measure embodied energy and embodied carbon. I think, you know, uh, in places like India, where energy consumption by itself is not very high, a lot of people don't have air conditioning across the house, especially not centrally done, right? This becomes an important issue. It can be, you know, world does not have the kind of space carbon wise to have all those 50% more new homes that are likely to come in India to be with the kind of embodied energy we're talking about. So really, and, and tools do exist. I think I wanted to bring this up to Somia's attention that we do have a tool that can quickly figure out, give people options, and, and, and really kind of get there. But I think we don't have a financing instrument, we don't have a policy instrument to push uh, this. And today you can't go to a shop and say, I want green cement or green steel, it's not possible. So that has to be another area that hasn't been tackled as such and would love to see this evolve. Thank you. Thanks, and, and, and yeah, we hear you that like a policy and the instruments and how we're gonna, we have to evolve together. And, uh, and I think something that you mentioned that it's also, see, like I hear from all of you, like we need more evidence space. We need to be talking about quality carbon measure and a lot of this certification and like this frameworks can help us on this. And then Mike, I have the question for you, if you could react to this, uh, that what was said and how P is working on actually doing the other side. So you should, uh, tell us a bit more of like the lessons you learn on the ground on ensure the policy, the standards and the NDCs as we are at COP also, like how they can be more uh, effective and what can we do on the front to walk at the same time and bring the finance we need to, to green transition. Yeah, yeah. Um, while I was listening to the, uh, to, to the colleagues, I was just thinking that a lot of what you said I also was sort of planning to say, so we're basically singing the same song and reading from the same page. I think that's very, very encouraging. Um, it also reminds me of a, another session we had this morning in the same room here, the launch of the Breakthrough Agenda for Buildings, uh, which added um, buildings as an important sector to the Breakthrough Agendas that were set last year in Glasgow. So, so I see also there's an emerging consensus on the fact that things need to be done, but also how they could be done uh, in, in the building sector. And I find that, that very encouraging. And for us, um, also the last one and a half years have been a very interesting learning experience. We've just been um, uh, granted a, a support for the P program by the GCF, the Green Climate Fund. Uh, they, they're gonna scale up the program by I think a value of 220 million US dollars for global outreach in 11 uh, countries. And this was, um, in that sense, a learning experience in the sense that a lot of the issues that the colleagues here have raised is uh, something that was particularly discussed with the GCF in the back and forth discussion in terms of you know, standardization, measurement, reporting, how do, you, how do you account for savings and the standards of a building. And I think it, it was um, interesting to see how the element of standardization is not just relevant for the for the private sector and for the banks and for the investment community, but also uh, for for mobilizing international climate finance. And I, I think uh, we we have to move you know, faster collectively on on these uh, subjects. And we also probably going to struggle with the challenge that, as I said earlier, a lot of the 
uh, the, the um, regulations and rules are different from country to country, but at the same time we have to somehow work towards an international standard and uh, um, the colleague from the IFC already, I think, described very well how this could happen through which dynamics. So th this is challenging, and um, but it also then enables us to talk seriously about buildings in, in NDCs. And that's also something where we had a bit of learning experience, especially with the government of Vietnam over the last two years. Uh, we've worked very closely with them to integrate and strengthen the building sector in their national NDCs, and we endeavor to, to offer that t type of support to more countries who, who want to who do that. Also on labels and standards and certificates, we have very good experience working with governments in Tunisia, Morocco, Senegal uh, to, uh, to help them understand what is needed and what could be done and at what level of govern governance do you need, what type of rules and regulations and implementation of these um, activities. And, and an additional element, and again, I, I uh, probably repeat what the colleague from the IFC has already said, um, designing public support schemes uh, by, by national governments, more and more probably also supported by international climate finance, to design these uh, incentive schemes, promotion schemes, uh, is, is something where we are, we are very much engaged in uh, with an increasing number of countries and now with the support from the, from the GCF uh, we intend to, to roll out this type of policy support to, to more and more countries and hope to make a, a small contribution also to a st bigger degree of international learning and standardization. Thank you, thank you so much. I think um, we are coming for the last round, but I, everything we hear on the building sector is like the complexity of it, that it's not gonna be one actor to like the complexity of the finance process. Um, the many, many different actors involved and how I think it was Praj that mentioned how easily climate can be forgotten within so many processes on materials and the construction and body carbon, etc. So um, I'm going to ask a very um, easy question. So if we can list one innovative, like w one direction on where we should we go to actually be able to come with innovative financing and, and be able to make a shift in this sector, what it would be, and then, <laughs> yeah, let's let's start with you, Suma, I think. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, one, I don't have an answer to that. You said that was an easy question. I think that's a very hard question and something that we <laughs> are all that's struggling true. with, but yeah. So uh, I think access, local governments accessing finance, I think that is, that is the largest challenge at this point is um, how, do we devolve all these? So this entire financing mechanisms that we are talking about, what is the capacity of a local government to be able to easily access this finance? What we are hearing from the local governments is the cost of accessing finance is so high. So that, that's it. It's kind of you know done for at the first step. So if your cost of accessing finance is high, then we are not doing it the right way. So. Uh, I think making it easier for the uh, local governments, even at the provincial level. So there are, uh, again, different countries, different systems, but uh, at the provincial level, uh, to build those capacities, one, and then uh, to have these mechanisms where uh, it is, it's made easier for them uh, to, and uh, to kind of mould these uh, to specific country context, I wouldn't go down even to the provincial level, but even at the country context, to uh, mould these schemes to specific country context is uh, also a challenge that we are seeing. And uh, yeah, and we all know the challenges with uh, the GCF and the GEF funding and et cetera, so I wouldn't go there, so. Mike, can you um, add up? Yeah, I, I guess, um, I mean, wh what, what's so nice about the building sector is that it's basically, let's say, centered around people, no? Because people live in these buildings, they use them for, for, for jobs or they live uh, with their families in them. And, 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 and that's why I think also from, a, from a, the, the point of how do you, you know, communicate successes and, and, and best practices and examples, I think there is uh, there is a, 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 a huge number of you know international cities networks and networks of govern uh, um, 
uh, city uh, mayors and so forth. So I think um, it, it's really um, an opportunity to uh, to exchange experience, best practice, and a lot of cities, I think, also have a lot of ingrained energy to talk about their successes and their good examples. Um, I mean, there's very good, I've seen uh, um, very interesting examples from uh, Geneva, where through collective efforts and a community development, um, uh, whole, let's say, areas of the cities have been refurbished, renovated, and uh, have gone green by that. Uh, there are um, plenty of examples from North Africa, Morocco, South Africa, and I think to really, you know, gather those, systematically analyze them, and see what could be transferred to other countries could be a, a very important momentum. Uh, to to, to uh, accelerate the agenda. Thank and Prash, could you add your two cents to the? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm super excited about this one. Actually, particularly because you know over the last ten years, I've been focused on buildings and now shifting to local governments, particularly, and seeing exactly this sort of you know how do you get cities to work? And I think I truly believe that you know climate change you know is not going to be won through NDCs and. <laughs> possibly it could be, but I think it will be won or lost in our cities, right? I think, you know, because if you can't make it work at that precinct level, uh, then I don't think there's that much hope to make it work. I mean, maybe on the energy supply side, we will get it all green energy and we'll be, you know, somehow we'll have energy, uh, electric cars, and that'll save the planet. But I doubt if it's going to be that straightforward. So, so I think we have to be very deliberate and clever. And so we are, this is exactly the sort of thing I do, uh, local government accessing green finance, so please reach out. Uh, let's partner. We, I think we need as many uh, connections, and you know, I think the time is running out, as you said, so I think we, you, know, you have the connections, you have the governments interested, we can do this, right? Uh, we can team up with GIZ, whatever it takes. But I think that exactly the footprint of where can they can access this financing is exactly, uh, it's not perfect, and I think uh, this, is, this is a challenge I get. Right now, one big ask. I think you asked, what was it? I think I know. I do the cities sort of workshop with many cities now, from Medellin all the way to, you know, Quezon City and African cities. One big, you know, when it comes to transport, waste, and water, most cities know how to handle it. They have a department for it. When it comes to buildings, there's no department, right? You get some urban guy and some building controls, and really, there's nobody actually in charge of their building stock frankly, because even the electricity is supplied by electricity companies. So that is the one big missing piece. I'm not suggesting we can overnight create a, a buildings department, but having a champion in cities that looks at the whole, perhaps some cities have it, like New York, you can see the fantastic regulations that have come, right, in terms of carbon pricing, or, or Singapore that has uh, some of the aspects that Tokyo has come up with penalty and cap and trade, you know, we need innovations like that, and that comes from understanding that it's beyond what they control. It has to be the private sector buildings, and that, that needs a special attention uh, that they should give. And my final thing is that, you know, yes, of course, cities need to access finance, but they can, you know, I think, uh, uh, I forgot the speaker earlier from, uh, that was talking about the pace financing. We need innovative aspects, like the property assessed clean energy finance, or using the property tax, I mean, just a simple idea, you know, why don't we get allow cities to increase the property tax for those who want to borrow uh, money to make the refurbishment? This is the hardest nut to crack, residential existing homes. You know, that's the hardest one. If you can have that long-term funding coming through a payback, coming through the utility bills or through property tax, you've got it, right? Because you have it locked based on the property, not on the owner, you're reducing risk, it can be transferred and it goes to the next person that buys a house. And that's the way we do it, I think. And, and US has shown that example really well with $10 billion of funding with pace financing, mostly in commercial buildings. But I'm super excited that we can shift, bring these ideas to our markets in emerging markets as well. Thank you. Thank you, Prash. And I think um, to, to finalize, I would like to be able to do that and use this kind of instruments, I think I'm gonna highlight something you did. We need actually leaders at the city level that are interested, are leading the way. It's gonna be very hard um, to, well, implement the policies, create the policies, do the, the if we don't have anyone like um, 
responsible and leading the way on that on the city side and may, like you brought you brought some examples. The trouble is we can't we can't wait for the leaders to happen. <laughs> That's the trouble. I mean, you know. <laughs> so so we have to find a workaround for that, I feel. So if it, there are no leaders at city, let's work at a at a, a state level, you know, a provincial level, something. You know, we need to find other ways beyond this. Well, I we can't are. I think the time is <laughs> Definitely. Or even in institutions such as the IFC, like people that are coming, uh, supporting with a long more term, uh, like leaders, if we could say, that can, and like institutions with the World Bank, the financiers, they are there and then can help on the continuity and even on a big challenge that cities face, which like the political changes in what sometimes makes the whole process start over again. So like I think in terms of leadership, we definitely need people that take over the problem and go till the end the end point, let's say, if, if there is one. So thank you so much. Like in terms of conclusions, definitely, I completely agree with you. I think uh, when we, we always talking about urban climate finance, but actually get access even to grants, it's the cost is so big <laughs> on everything that you have to work around that uh, at the city level. We always uh, raising the aspect that the cities don't have the capacity to do it. And when they do, when the project is there, not necessarily it's going to be easy. You need a, you j need to pay capacity to be able to get access to the money. And this is public money and private money. So that's that's a very, very good point. And we need to definitely to communicate the best practice. I think the Global ABC is doing an amazing job on trying to bring this on. I think this pavilion is also like a, a, a result of that. And we hope to contribute for CCFLA to bringing the city perspective into the finance, we are. We hope to contribute um, to the to this very complex uh, but very powerful and, and important debate on on the beauty side. So, thank you so much, and thank you so much for being here, online and in person. Thanks, and good cop. <laughs> yes. Prash, if you can stay there and smile, we're gonna take a picture.